When you go into the King James Version of the Bible and you read John chapter 2, 11, it says, The beginning of his miracles did Yahshua do in Cana of Galilee and manifest forth his glory. However, what's really written is doxa, meaning judgment. Every miracle that Yahshua performed during his ministry was rendering judgment on the rabbinical, Talmudic, man-made teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. From the time that he ordered that man to walk from the defiling of the Pharisees' stone water pots to the making of mud from spit and dust on the Sabbath day, even down to commanding a lame man to carry his bedroll on the Sabbath again. This was all a slug at the Talmudic man-made Pharisaic teachings and it violated their rules, not Yah's. Now on the third day there was a marriage in Cana in the land of Galilee. This would have been Tuesday. This is the day after Yahshua met Nathanael in Bethsaida. And there was a marriage in Cana about a half day's walk from Bethsaida. In the book of John chapter 2 verses 1 through 2 we read, On Yom Shlishi, that's the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and Miriam, the mother of Yahshua, was there. And Yahshua and his disciples were also invited to the marriage. Now, culturally, weddings of this type of stature within the community would have been planned at least a year in advance, and Yahshua would have been invited months before the actual event. This was not a haphazard, thrown-together, last-minute type of feast. Weddings at this point in time, uh, culturally for the biblical people, it was a big thing. You know, you had large families, and it took a long time to get everybody gathered in one central spot, one location for the feast. We didn't have text messages in the whole entire nine. Now, it had been nearly two months that Yahshua had left his home after his mikvah in the Jordan River. And then we find him here at this wedding. Back in John, we read John chapter 2, verses 2 to 3. They ran out of wine, so the mother of Yahshua said to him, They have no more wine, Yahshua said to her. My lady, why should this be a concern of mine? It is not yet my time. Now when most people, myself included, first read that, you think that when he's speaking on his time, He's talking about his death and resurrection. And then it also would have you to believe, reading the King James Version, that he's barking at his mother. But that's not what's happening. And this is why it's so important to read scripture with historical and cultural and ethnic content available and applicable. Because Yahshua's mother would have had the great responsibility as the hostess. Much like you see Miriam and Martha dealing with the multitude, when they got a host and one of the sisters is tripping out because this isn't done. It was a big deal for the lady of the entire event to have the responsibility of tending to all the guests. And this so happened to fall on Yahshua's mom's lap. But Yahshua, according to the ancient custom, as the son, would not have had the same duties as the other servants. It wouldn't have been his job to serve wine. That wasn't his time. Every performance was orchestrated. You eat this meal, you bring this out, you bring the wine, you bring the water, you bring everything is orchestrated and all the servants have a role to play. And it wasn't Yahshua's time because his role was not to bring the wine. And for us as the reader, we're not really privy to the entire conversation that he had with his mother. We do know it could have been something like this. Yahshua says, lady, okay, I'll get the wine, but I'm going to do it my way. She would have been like, please, Yahshua. This is a big day. Don't go messing with these Pharisees. Don't go messing with them. Don't go doing anything that's going to cause a ruckus. Please, just let's just have a smooth wedding. He, he said, listen, I'll grab the wine, put the servants at my command. Just tell them keep their mouth shut. We can confirm this because she eventually tells the servants that are under her command, hey, do whatever my son says to do. She relieves the command of herself and gives it to him. This is how we knew that she had it. For her to be able to command the servants to now go and listen to whatever her son says to do, they had to have been listening to her at first. And she's panicking because there's no more wine. In John chapter 2 verse 6 we read, Now there were six stone water pots for the purifying of the Jews. Each pot held about two or three liters of peace. The inclusion of stone water pots tells us that this was a Pharisaic wedding. This was not a Hebrew, Hebraic wedding completely. This was dominated by the Pharisees and their teachings because these six stone water pots that are used for purification is mentioned nowhere in the Torah. 
Nowhere in the Bible. However, you can find it in the Talmud. Look at your screen. And the master of ceremonies is the head rabbi of that particular synagogue. He is the featured guest, if you will, at a wedding that's not his own. Now, water is normally carried from the well in a wine skin or a ceramic pot. If the container had been used for grapes in the past or even vinegar and you put water in that container, the water can have a, mm, a slight taste of wine or vinegar left over. According to the Talmudic rituals, this would have rendered that unclean. Now again, this is not the Most High's command. This is what these sages say. Furthermore, they couldn't even use any of that liquid that came out of that pot unless the master of the ceremonies knew about it and sanctified it before they drank it. But of course, they would have to have known first. According to Rabina Glaw, stone cannot contract ritual impurity. So wine-tainted water must be put in a stone vessel that is filled to the very brim. The stone water pot is then lowered into the waters of a mikvah. And as soon as the waters from the mikvah kiss the waters that is in the stone pot, it is immediately brought up and then sanctified. So Yahshua then says to the servants, fill the water pots up with water. And they filled it to the brim. He then tells them, now draw out of the same water pots and then give it to the master of the ceremonies, i.e. the rabbi. They did so, but they did not mikvah the water. When the master of the feast tasted the water, which was then turned into wine, he had no idea where it came from. But the servants which drew the water, <laughs> they knew. And really, as long as the servants kept their mouth closed, there wouldn't have been a problem. But if the rabbi happened to find out what they just did, oh man, all hell would break loose. No pun intended. He would have found out that Yahshua had deliberately defiled his ceremony by breaking their religious customs, by breaking their commandments, not the Father's. In John 2 verse 10, we read, The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said, At the beginning of the feast, everyone sets forth the choicest wine. And after men have well drunk, then they have brought out that which was inferior. But you have kept the most excellent wine unto now. And we don't really read about it, but I have no doubts at all that they eventually found out very soon where this wine came from and were highly offended. And that's the first miracle that Yahshua did. It did not bring forth his glory. It brought forth his doxa, his judgment against whom? was not the Gentiles, it were these people who were masquerading as the sons of light, the sons of Elohim. And from that day forward, they hated him. They sought to kill him. They sought to get rid of him by any means necessary, by creating alliances for whomever they need to, even the very devil himself, because he took it straight to them. And you, as the constituent, you as a bride of Yahshua, when you read about what he has done, it is to be expected that you know these things already. Because at one point in time, they were common knowledge. Most of the Christians teach that he did away with the law because they read the Feast of the Jews, not knowing that there's a distinction. When you see that Feast of the Jews is always italicized, these are the Sadducees, these are the Pharisees. Yeshua himself was a Jew. He didn't break the Father's commandment, but he did break commandments. It was just those of men. He didn't break the Father's laws, but he did break laws. Just those of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. For this very reason, a lot of people under Christianity have been duped and led to believe, sometime innocently, sometime ignorantly, that Yahshua came to start a new religion, a new way of life, a new thinking, a new way of operating, but that isn't so. He came to establish. When you talk about an establishment, establish means to set on or set upon, to found. And mint, again, is dealing with the mind, mental, mentality. So he established a new mind, a renewed mind, rather, being one with the Father as the Father is one with him. And if we abide in Yahshua, then we also abide in him. He abides in us. We are all a hard one. But until you have adopted this mind, this Hebraic mind, not Christian, not Pharisaic, not Sadduceic, not even the European Jews, but the Hebraic mind frame, there will be a disconnect. And as you continue to read of the miracles that brought forth his glory, Understand that it didn't bring forth this glory, it brought forth his judgment. Every miracle that he performed wasn't by accident. As the apostle says, and these things that are written only but a fraction, had everything been written about Yahshua that he did, it'd be too numerous for a book. 
So I make this today with hopes that this will spark your journey, your deeper dive into the man that people think they know but really have no idea about. And may the spirit of Yah descend upon you like a dove and guide your teaching and your study and your rediscovery of your Mashiach. Selah.